Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming to my talk. My name is Igor, and today we're going to be talking about building reliable data pipelines. As I mentioned, my name is Igor. I am the co-founder and CTO of BigEye. Before BigEye, I worked on data platforms at a number of companies, uh, most recently at Uber. I was one of the first people called a data engineer there. I helped uh, build the first data warehouse, a lot of the tooling around it, ETL, data modeling, reporting, so on and so forth. And I worked both on the data platform team as well as internal analytics projects for teams such as ad tech, experimentation, and uh, driver payments. So why are we having a conversation about data reliability today? Data has been around for a while. And historically, data has always been used for offline analytics. You would have an analyst who would pull data from a warehouse, build some sort of report, check it, uh, make sure that the numbers make sense, and then sit down with executives and the product team and present their uh, findings in order to make some sort of a decision. Now, because the analyst was there in the middle between the data and the uh, data product, which in their case was the report, it was easy to catch issues ahead of time. The analyst could come in and say, this number looks wrong, this graph shouldn't trend this way, delay the meeting, a check with the data team, make sure that there weren't any issues with the data that they're pulling, and then fix the report and present it afterwards. Over time, with the growth of the amount of data as well as the type of data available to businesses, you have a lot more data products that are less that can have less human involvement and are also much more critical to the business itself. You might have ETLs that are pushing data out of your company warehouse to other partner companies to do reporting. This is a, a great example. This is ad tech where Facebook will report the performance of your ads back to you. And product teams are using machine learning in order to power some of the features that they have. And machine le learning is completely autonomous. There's no humans once the model is trained and in production. Nobody is really monitoring the data that's going into it or the results that it's producing until much later on. Because data products are now uh, becoming more critical to the business and much more autonomous, it's very important to ensure the reliability so that there aren't negative consequences when bad data comes into the uh, product and breaks not just your relationship with the your partner companies, but even sometimes leading to customer churn. Therefore, the onus is now on all engineers, not just data engineers, but also software engineers to understand data reliability and why it's important and how to ensure it in your applications and data products. The biggest change that has sparked this is that pi data pipelines are not part of your application. Historically, applications were individual services that served some sort of a function or purpose and they mostly relied on data that they generated themselves. A user would input a form, the form was then stored in the application, and that was the only way to get data into it. Now you have applications that are pulling data from different parts of the business, maybe internal and external sources to the business, and then doing something with that data that is then powering some core functionality of that product or that service. So first and foremost, it's important to know what data is your application using? Where is it coming from? What does it look like? What are the caveats around using it? You should be talking to the stakeholders uh, in your business, making sure that you're pulling the right information from the right places and using it appropriately. And make sure that you're clarifying why you're even using this data and what it's supposed to do as part of your application. Secondly, data pipelines should be treated as part of it. Because they are providing the critical pieces of information for your application to function, you should be treating data pipelines like they are a part of your application. A lot of this means testing your pipelines and monitoring them in the same way that you would test and monitor your software. You write unit tests for your code. You're doing some monitoring on the performance of it, of your service, uh, latency, memory consumption, so on and so forth. 
you should be doing the same thing for the data pipelines themselves. Luckily for us, data processing frameworks such as Spark make this a lot easier where you can actually build your data pipelines in some more advanced uh, programming language and it doesn't always have to be raw SQL against a database. So now that we know that we want to get data into the application and we've talked to our stakeholders and um, owners about what this data is and how it's going to be used, let's talk about how we're going to be getting the data into your application in a usable format. There's really two ways of getting data to be a uh, part of your application. It can either be pushed in, streaming frameworks and real-time data are very popular now, or being other applications calling your APIs to publish data to you, or it might be pulled in. This could be reading data from a, directly from a database. Maybe it's pulling a file from S3 or some SFTP server or calling another application's APIs and um, doing something with, their, uh, with the results of there. Now, the strategies for ensuring data reliability really depend on how your application is actually getting this data. When data is pulled in, you often have a lot more control over how much data you're pulling at a time, whether you can process the, this information in batch, whether you can read it again. If you're pulling from a database, you can rerun the query. If somebody updates a file, you can repull it. You, your application has a lot more control around how it's consuming its data, when it's consuming it, when it is reprocessing it. You should, uh, however, when data is being pushed in, you often don't have as much control over what is being published to you. There might be a bad message on a Kafka topic that you read, but your application is still responsible for dealing with that bad data, whether emitting it, correcting it, raising a warning, or doing some other uh, type of action. It's important to understand how is your application consuming this data so that then you can come up with the right strategy and the right mechanisms. Typically, if data is pushed in, you, you're going to want to be a lot more defensive than if you're pulling it in and can reprocess it at any point in time later. So how do we even get to ensure, ensuring reliability in data pipelines? Well, first of all, you want to be testing your data transformation logic just like you would test your code. Now, testability in data has been a tricky concept historically. When a lot of data pipelines and data processing was done in SQL, it was notoriously difficult to actually test any information, any data that you're pulling. Creating mock data sets uh, and mock tables, running the SQL process and then checking the output was a tedious process that not a lot of people wanted to do. Also thinking through edge cases and creating the right mock data sets was a lot harder. If you're building your data pipelines in a more uh, in a more general programming language, such as Python, Java, Scala, you can you should be treating your data transformation logic like you would any other piece of your code. You can, you can sit down, you can think through the edge cases, you can write the appropriate unit tests and test the pieces of transformation individually. They should all be functions that are composable, that are doing small things and one operation at a time, and then test them with as many edge cases as you can think of so that then you know that it, as the data comes in, your pipeline is always doing the right thing, whether transforming it correctly or dealing with errors uh, as they come in. Now that you've tested your data transformation logic, it's important to make sure that the data that's actually flowing through that logic is correct or lives up to some sort of expectation that you have of it. First of all, this is where clarifying your expectations with your stakeholders is very important. You need to know what does the data represent? What does it look like? What should you be expecting about it? And what are non-negotiables? For example, you might have some fields that have to be there for your processing to be held true. Or maybe you have specific ranges of numbers that outside of that range, your logic just doesn't make sense. Checking your data for completeness, making sure that when you're pulling data in, that the file is not empty, all the fields are present. The best way to 
do this is by creating a well-defined schema for the data that's coming in. You probably have some sort of expectations and you can assert these expectations by checking that the data coming in, whether that's being pushed in or you have pulled in batch from somewhere else, conforms to this well-defined schema and your expectations. Finally, you, implementing data observability allows you to understand when the data that you're using is changing unexpectedly. You get, here we have a screenshot of Big Eye monitoring a number of aspects about the data that's flowing in order to help you paint a picture of what did your data look like historically? What does it look like today? And are there any attributes about your data that are behaving anomalously? If your data all of a sudden changes, if for example, a field that was never null before be becomes null 100% of the time, if your numbers go out of a range that's expected, it might be worthwhile to raise a flag and start looking into it because maybe the expectations have changed. Maybe the upstream team hasn't conveyed an update that they've made to you and you're still relying on old assumptions that may no longer hold true. Once you validate those assumptions, you can then go back, update your schema to make sure that you know what is validated and what's not and continue doing all your processing but being much more in tune with how these changes are affecting your logic. Finally, as your data uh, application is consuming data and doing something with it, it's generating a lot of data output. Now, this can come in a lot of different shapes and sizes. Maybe this is logs that your application is emitting about what it's doing. Maybe it's information that it's storing after it's been processed. But all of this information and data output is useful to somebody else and to somebody else's application in the same way that your application is consuming someone's data. Your application is also publishing data that somebody else is probably consuming. So what are the best practices for dealing with your data output? Well, as we talked earlier, having a schema for this data, knowing what you're producing and being able to express it in a meaningful way that somebody else can read and understand is very important. You should then take that schema and make sure that the data that you're outputting is available in some well understood format or location. Usually the, we're talking about Kafka topics for logs or maybe in an application database that is then synced into your data lake or data warehouse. Make sure that the schema that you've defined in step one is actually the same schema as you are using to publish your data out though. Once you've, you start publishing this data, go talk to the people that are interested in this. Understand who the consumers are of your data output. Talk to them about what expectations they have, what assumptions are they making, and help them correct these assumptions. Maybe people are trying to use your data output for something that you didn't think about, and they have a valid use case for why they would want to have a certain assumption about your data that you're outputting versus not. Maybe it's about formats. Maybe it's about how what fields are should or shouldn't be populated. It's patterns ac in, across fields that are important to them. You can take that, and you can then use that to evolve your schema and, evolve and add more things that you are outputting for your application. Finally, as a data producer, you can leverage the same notions of data observability that we talked about a little bit earlier in order to understand when does the data that you're producing change and use that to notify your customers. Don't You don't always have to uh, have the consumer of your data rely, rely on the consumers of your data to catch any issues with it. You should be as proactive as possible about communicating these changes and communicating any issues that you might be producing. So what are some of the takeaways of this talk? First of all, treat your data pipelines as though they are part of your application. Make sure that you're testing them and monitoring them as you would any other piece of code or any other service that you're producing. Understand how you're getting data in and out of your application. Make sure that there's a well-known schemas, that the data is actually conforming to those schemas. 
make sure that you're monitoring it for any changes or deviations from the norm that could throw off your processing or your consumer's processing. Testing your transformation logic for uh, to ensure reliability is really important. If you are building a data pipeline from scratch, I highly recommend using a powerful framework such as Spark, or if you're using um, custom code, writing it in a, more, in a more general language than SQL in order to be able to break down your transformation logic and test it independently of the data itself. And finally, have a strategy for the data that your application produces. Make sure you know how you're going to evolve the schema when you make changes to it and how you're communicating to users, to the consumers and other users of your data. So we've briefly mentioned data observability here. So let's talk about what the big eye approach is to and how it fits into data reliability. The first step of data reliability is ensuring that the processing is correct and that the data is not changing and conforms to your expectations. In order to know that it's conforming to your expectations, you need to be able to monitor it and have a plan for data observability in the same way that you would have observability for your applications and the servers. What Big Eye provides is a data observability platform, which helps uh, your team create a processes that ensure the reliability of your data and improve the velocity and change of this, because you're able to analyze, communicate, and monitor this data in an efficient manner, both internally to your team, as well as downstream to your stakeholders. Big Eye works by connecting to your data warehouse, computing some metrics about your data, automatically setting thresholds that are meaningful, and then using those thresholds to notify uh, users of your data or any uh, stakeholders for the data that Big Eye is monitoring about any unexpected changes or deviations from the norm. The way that Big Eye does this is through the notion of SLAs. In the same way that you have SLAs for your applications, your servers, where you have expectations around the response time or the uptime of your application, Big Eye helps you create SLAs around your data and the contents of it. If you look at a, what a data SLA looks like, they're usually defined at the level of a given table. Let's say you have a user dimension table here, and the SLA that your, te uh, your team has agreed to is make sure that the user table is 90% reliable. This might mean that the duplicate rate of user IDs is le uh, less than, uh, is th that the user table does not have any duplicates uh, at up to 90% or more of, 90% uh, or more of the time. This then leads to 7.2 hours of downtime within a given uh, month. So you can then plan around that. If there are duplicates that are entering the table, you might take specific actions in order to notify your stakeholders, stop changes to ETL jobs, roll back something that was recently updated, and make sure that your consumers aren't a reading bad data and that they know that something is going wrong with a data product that you have this SLA around. In Big Eye, SLAs are represented by this grouping of metrics. You can track these, uh, Big Eye will track these metrics over time, automatically set these thresholds, and then notify your users through Slack, through email, about any SLAs that are going out of bounds and which metrics specifically are affecting that SLA and why that a big guy thinks that's a problem with the data. You can then use that in order to go in and investigate and find out what is actually happening in the data and take any sort of corrective action that you would need to take. Thank you for uh, coming to my talk and listening. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions right now and answer them live. Or if you have any further questions about Big Eye or data reliability in general, you can reach out to me at my contact information below. Finally, I do want to mention that if you enjoyed this talk and uh, you enjoy thinking about how to make your data processes much more reliable, 
we are uh, big guy is hosting a data reliability engineering conference where there will be a number of talks about data reliability how it is being implemented in industry as well as where do people think that data reliability is going and how do we ensure it uh, across different uh, applications and different businesses. It's going to be on December 14th and it's a virtual event. You can sign up for it by going to drecon.org.